we welcome your remote attendance from Cal Poly. And you can also view Zach's slides uploaded on the PresQT uh, workshop website if he's overlapping here. You can download his slides and follow along there. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Zach. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, Natalie. You, Natalie. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Hi. So just, so just to begin, um, I wanted to do just a little bit of a background about Software Preservation Network, uh, just a brief history. Um, in 2014, um, my colleague uh, Jessica Meyerson and I uh, presented uh, at the Society of American Archivists um, uh, meeting in, um, in Washington, actually, Washington, D.C., uh, just kind of proposing the idea of, of creating a, a community-based uh, approach to preserving software and just kind of trying to get the discussion rolling. Um, and then that kind of developed into um, a, a grant project that we're uh, now at the tail end of um, that was funded by the uh, by IMLS, which really um, <laughs> that grant, the scope of that grant was a planning project. Uh, it was a national forum grant. So uh, one of the major deliverables of that uh, grant was to um, uh, convene a forum of um, interested uh, parties and colleagues uh, about uh, the issue of software preservation. Uh, we also conducted a needs assessment about what the needs were within the cultural heritage uh, sector for uh, legacy software and the need to uh, preserve software. Um, and then, uh, as I said, we had that forum uh, uh, last August, August 1st in Atlanta. It was attended by about 35 uh, people. Um, and if you uh, visit the uh, OSF link that's at the bottom of each slide here. Um, you'll see a lot of documentation related to that uh, forum and some of the outcomes that came out of that forum. Um, and then finally, right after the, uh, the uh, forum, we started trying to build on, the, on uh, all of the uh, work and energy that we um, at the forum and turning the software preservation network into something more than just the project that we had for this, this planning project. And one of the ways that we tried to pursue that was forming working groups uh, around different topics related to software preservation. And I'll talk a little bit more about those working groups in just a minute. Um, and so in just in the short, short amount of time that I have today, I wanted to highlight two parts of uh, the software preservation network. Um, and so uh, one of those is our attempt to gather use cases about software preservation. Uh, from the very beginning um, uh, of our project, uh, various uh, constituents um, from uh, legal experts to um, uh, people within cultural heritage as well to everybody wants to know how how will the preserved software uh, be used because that really dictates a lot of the uh, conversation that needs to needs to take place is that we really need to have a clearly identified uh, use case or set of use cases that we can articulate to people um, and we have some we have gathered over the course of our planning project we have gathered some use cases but we really need more and we uh, have really started to build our capacity to solicit and receive uh, those use cases in a more standardized way uh, so that they're more consistently formatted and uh, can just be um, used and packaged uh, in uh, more effective ways. So this URL that um, uh, is uh, displayed on the slides um, will send people to a, a Google form which will make it easy to submit um, a use case and I would encourage everyone to, uh, if they have a use case that they would like to submit about uh, software preservation, um, this would be a good, a good use of, our, uh, of your time because uh, we really, this is some, something that we're focusing on right now. And um, yeah, <clears throat> and yeah, just to, the, the importance of the use cases can't, just can't be overestimated. Um, 
uh, stakeholders like software publishers, uh, people that are developing community best practices. Um, and that can be in the legal context, but also in just the, um, in just the practitioner context too. Um, <clears throat> advocating to your uh, local library <clears throat> and academic administrators and resource allocator, allocators on the importance of uh, participating in this effort to preserve software. And uh, finally, and this might be uh, something that this, this group might appreciate even more, is that <clears throat> if we can collect these use cases in a kind of a standardized, consistent way, it could actually end up being a, a data set in the end. So, so that's one thing. And then uh, the next um, part of uh, the Software Preservation Network that I wanted to um, highlight is the working groups that we formed. Um, so very, very soon, as I mentioned, after the forum in August, um, Jessica and I uh, put out a call to participate and lead a set of working groups that were related to, the, to a community roadmap that had been developed during, um, during the forum by the forum attendees. And by November of 2016, we had coordinators for each group plus two or three participants in each group. Um, and some, some folks served on more than one group. Um, and since that time, the ranks of the working groups has, has really uh, started to grow uh, and has resulted in a, a clearly articulated um, set of scopes for each, uh, scope statements for each uh, working group. Um, we have our uh, open science framework uh, repository. Um, there's a survey on metadata practices on so software that the metadata working group is um, is currently working on. They, they've actually put out that survey. You may have seen it on some of the listservs. Uh, we, re we have really, um, one of our struggles during the planning project was the communication uh, strategy. And we really, the help of the working groups have, have really uh, developed that communication strategy, um, which is not only just general things like, you know, blog posts and uh, social media, really what we want to achieve with the communication working group is to facilitate the alignment of messaging about software preservation across related projects on the cultural heritage sector and in the academic field. Um, but I, I'd like to highlight the work of two of the working groups um, for this uh, particular talk, uh, as they may have some um, some more specific uh, relevance for, for the press QC uh, attendees. Um, the first is the research working group, which is led by uh, Wendy uh, Hagenmeyer at Georgia Tech uh, University, uh, and also includes members of the current CLEAR software cur curation co cohort. Um, and you'll hear more about the research uh, working group uh, during the brainstorm brainstorming session, which I believe will be following the lightning talks. Um, they are working on uh, developing a research agenda, research agenda for software preservation. So one of the things that we've, uh, that we've really noticed as we um, investigate uh, the challenges of software preservation more and more is that there are um, many areas that are in need of focused uh, research attention. Um, and considering the way that software just develops at such a rapid pace, there really needs to be somebody, or not somebody, there needs to be uh, several, uh, several researchers um, really keeping a close eye and uh, documenting and developing their research around this uh, topic. Uh, so in this way, they're, they're kind of playing, the research working group is kind of playing a coordinating role within the broader software preservation community uh, and are actively seeking input from other software preservationists. Of course, nothing that the, the Software Preservation Network um, does is trying to dictate anything and that uh, goes with the uh, working group as well. Um, they really want to seek input from everybody else on what research areas uh, are in most need. And then the second working group to highlight is the Software Curation Readiness Working Group, which is led by 
Fernando Rios at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, this group has developed a set of generalized use cases in part to investigate how software might be developed with a, a long-term curation as part of its features. Um, as curation can typically, typically take place earlier in the process with software created to facilitate research and scholarship, uh, this work seems to be of particular significance to uh, the press QC attendees. And then just one last thing that I wanted to say was um, we're really interested in not only soliciting uh, uh, input uh, for our own projects, but uh, the Software Preservation Network and the people that are involved in it would also be interested in hearing how we could contribute to the press QC. Um, effort. And so uh, I just wanted to um, give our email address and our contact form that's on our website and encourage anybody that's interested in what we're doing or would be interested in um, letting us know how we could contribute um, to CRESQC to feel free to get in touch and uh, contact us. Thank you, Zach. That's awesome. Um, everyone, um, I'll give you a brief opportunity to ask Zach a couple of questions while we queue up our next demo, which will be Ian Taylor. Um, you'll notice on the end of your agenda, we'll conclude today with a brainstorming session where Ewan Cochran, who's here with us, um, will lead some uh, members of our audience as a panel where we can all ask questions, thinking about ways we can collaborate between PresQT and Software Preservation Network. Um, but also how Software Preservation Network um, can become more aware of the other activities and practitioners in the room so that that feedback can go both ways. So thank you, Zach. Any questions right now? If not, we'll bid you adieu, Zach. And if you can hop back on during brainstorming, terrific. Otherwise, we'll um, perhaps see you online tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Cool.